Good morning. Welcome to uh, Fellowship Online. Again, we're glad you guys are joining us this morning or this afternoon. I'll admit last week um, the Tuttleby family didn't kind of get to the service until at least after 1230 or somewhere thereabouts. So if you're joining us late, welcome. Um, we got a couple of new or a new thing that we're adding this week. We have um, emailed you all the words to the worship so you guys can join in. I guess you call it like worship karaoke or something like that worship from home, but those words have been emailed to you guys, so if you want to take a time when we get to the worship, just pause things, print those off if you need to, or do it ahead of time, and then you can join in with the singing um, as we worship God together. That would be great. Um, also included with that email, we've also included a financial summary, because some of you guys have been asking about that. Where are we at? How are things going? How's the giving? So that's been sent out, so you should have an update on some of that as well. If you didn't receive that email, Shoot Richard a text or something like that, and we'll get that out to you guys. Um, last week on Saturday, a number of us around here, a bunch of guys helped me, and we delivered some Easter lilies to pretty much everyone in the church, I think. Hopefully, we got everyone in the church anyway. So um, we really enjoyed doing that. We've heard lots of good feedback from that, that you guys enjoyed receiving those Easter lilies, um, which is awesome. Um, we enjoyed delivering them to you guys and just kind of hanging out and chatting and getting to, you know, touch base with some of you people and stuff like that. It was really good for us to see you. But what struck us this week is that as much as some of us got a chance to catch up with you and to see you guys, that you guys haven't all necessarily seen one another. And so what we thought we would do, we've come up with this really silly idea, really. Um, and we're going to have you guys text me at 903-908-1439 um, a series of videos, just little selfie videos. 20 seconds, 30 seconds max long um, of you doing some activity that you would normally do. It could be gardening, you might be playing a board game with your family, um, driving to the store, whatever it is. Be creative, have fun with it, um, and just send me a quick 20 second video, just kind of a life update of how are you doing, say hi to Fellowship and everybody else, and I'll piece all that together and we'll post it on the website in a week or so. If you can get that to me by next Friday, and I will start then releasing some stuff to the website and whatever else so you guys can kind of just kind of catch up and have similar but not quite experiences we did delivering the Easter lilies to you guys and catching up with you. So um, get those together, get those sent out. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And again, we miss you guys, but enjoy the service. Thanks. Of our Savior, the mercy of our God, the cross that leaves no question of the measure of His love. Our change are gone, our dead is paid, the cross has overthrown the, the grave, for Jesus' blood that sets us free, means death to death, and life for me. The innocent just guilty While the guilty one walks free Death would be his portion And all the portion liberty Our chains are gone, our dead is paid, the cross has overthrown the grave, for Jesus' blood that sets us free, means death to death, and life for me. I give my whole life to honor this love 
for the lamb who was slain. I'm forgiven, the sinner Savior, crown him forever. For the lamb who was slain, he is risen. I give my whole life to honor this love for the Lamb who was slain. I'm forgiven, the sinner Savior, crown him forever. For the Lamb who was slain, he is cross has overthrown the grave for Jesus' blood that sets us free means death to death and life for me means death to death and life for me means death to death and life for me. Greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm Ronnie Thompson, and just want to welcome everybody to Fellowship and the online version of Fellowship. Um, I think... Uh, just want to give a, a few updates in, uh, from our personal family and working from home. Uh, actually, I go into work every day, but uh, my wife and my daughter in education, they're, they're working from the house as much as possible. Uh, we've had a great time uh, visiting with family because our neighbors are my in-laws. So the Tipton Thompson compound is doing great as far as uh, being able to spend time around family. It's been just fantastic. Uh, they even revived uh, the garden. I haven't seen a garden planted in several years, and one was planted this year. So looking forward to what's going to be produced out of the garden. Uh, looking forward to eating a lot of vegetables in the future. <laughs> uh, just want to give an update on uh, the church itself. Uh, we know, you know, during this time, I think the one thing I miss is just visiting with everybody, being, seeing everybody's face. Uh, greeting everybody, talking to everybody, having little conversations here and there. And you know, a great way to still do that is through the community groups. Uh, the, the online version of the community groups in using the Zoom has been fantastic uh, because you still get to interact and ask questions and make comments from time to time when needed. Uh, but uh, but that, that part is still great. So if you want to join us for community groups on Sunday mornings, those are still alive and well. Let's see. Um, Important factor, you know, still, uh, we still have uh, bills to pay, et cetera, as a church and as we move forward. So the giving portion is, is very important. Online giving at this point is the, uh, I guess, the, the only way to give. I wouldn't say the only way to give. You can mail it in, but it's the primary way to give. So if you do have a chance to uh, do the online giving, I can tell you that you can text, text to give. Uh, to an amount to 84321 and uh, otherwise you can go to the the church's website and also find the online giving site and be able to access that from there as well um, you know a, a hard thing for me today uh, was it, it just felt like a little bit of hope got taken away as I was still hopeful that we would be able to close out the school year and say goodbyes to our kids and our staff for a great school year. We always have an end of the year celebration. Uh, we're always able to recognize those teachers of the years, the retirees that we have, but more importantly, we're also able to say goodbye to our kids and have a great summer and see you next year and, and congratulations on your graduation. Uh, with the governor's, governor's announcement today, he, um, he shut us down for the rest of the school year, which is understandable and, and we kind of expected it, but still it, it it makes that part hard. It takes that little bit of hope away that we had to, to come back and be able to say goodbye to everybody. Um, so that part kind of hurt a little bit. Uh, but um, 
I know, you know, God's got this and all of this is in his hands, you know, as we move forward. Um, so with that, I just want to, um, to go ahead and say a prayer uh, before we move, move any further on. Um, you know, from time to time, you know, we, we hear things, we're hearing a lot about the coronavirus. Uh, we're hearing uh, lots of information. And so uh, we don't know what's true, what's not true sometimes, because it all seems to be coming from credible sources. Um, but anyway, let us pray. Dear Lord, uh, I just come to you in prayer and, and realize that all the information that we're receiving, uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's from the world. It's the worldly information. You know, we don't know what direction to go a lot of times, but we know that your word is true. Uh, we know that, that the information that we receive from your word guides us in our daily living, in the decisions that we make from day to day. Uh, we ask that you bless our leaders in this time as they continue to make decisions that are for the betterment of our state and our community and our country as a whole. Um, we know this will pass and we know your word will still stand strong as it has uh, for many, many years. Uh, we ask these things in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're part of Fellowship Bible Church, we are so glad you're here. And if you're a guest that has just clicked in to uh, be part of our time, uh, we count it an honor that you have chosen to uh, worship the Lord with us. And I hope that the next uh, couple of minutes in the Word will benefit you and, and really all of us. Uh, you know, it's so interesting that the last several weeks, I think we've all learned a new vocabulary. I mean, I never had once heard the term shelter in place or social distance, uh, flattening the curve. There's all kinds of new lingo that's out there. But you know, one of the words that gets used a lot, and we heard it before, but it's kind of got a whole new meaning, and that is the word essential. I remember when the, the, the county judge issued the order, it was like, who's essential? Am I essential? Is our organization essential? What's essential? Well. You know what's really essential? It's maintaining relationships. I think one of the most essential elements of our life are the relationships that we have. If we're privileged enough to be married, our relationship with our spouse. If uh, we have children or siblings, the relationship we have with them. Our coworkers. Uh, Relationships are essential. And you know what's essential in that essential element of our life? Relationships? It's maintaining them. See, because relationships are so fragile. I mean, we walk through life and they get bumped and bruised and wounded. And you've got to maintain those relationships. You've got to mend those relationships a lot. I mean, I don't care whether it's with a spouse or a parent or a child or a coworker. You got two brains involved eventually, regularly, there's going to be offenses. There's going to be misunderstandings. There's going to be hurts. And you know what? Those things need to be taken care of. Those things need to be tended to. Now, let me tell you something that happens way too often. It's like there will be a conflict, there'll be a hurt, there'll be an offense. And I'm probably the worst culprit of all in, when it comes to this stuff. It's like, you know what? I probably should go have that crucial conversation. I probably should bring it up. But you know what I do? I strategically have a conversation with them, but it's not about that. It's about the cowboys. It's about the coronavirus. It's about something that the president's done or hasn't done. It's about something else. And if that conversation goes okay, it's like, oh, good, the relationship's great. Wrong. I mean, those things are like little pebbles in our shoe. And you get enough of them, you get sick of it, and the relationship starts to crater. It starts to collapse. One of the most essential things in life are relationships. And one of the most essential things to taking care of those relationships, it is making sure we handle those offenses I'm talking about those times when there needs to be confession and forgiveness. And if we let those things fester, I mean, it can cause all sorts of pain and suffering. 
And really, it can even lead to just broken relationships that are almost beyond repair. Now, I bring all of this up because, as you know, about five weeks ago, life changed. But here's what was going on. Since January, we have done a study of the life of Joseph. Joseph, the, the great-grandson of Abraham. Abraham's one of the most significant people that ever walked to the face of the earth. And we were studying about his son, his great-grandson, Joseph. And we had spent nine weeks studying Joseph. And we saw that Joseph, I mean, he had a hard life. He's raised in this incredibly dysfunctional family. Dad had four wives. He was a polygamist. And Joseph, he was the oldest son of the favorite wife. You'd think, hey, that's great. But in reality, that made for a very tough life because his 10 older brothers just totally despised him because his dad, Jacob, just so favored him. I mean, if you've got older brothers and, and all of that stuff going on, you know what it's like. It's a little tough to be the little baby brother. Well, when you're the little baby brother and you happen to be the favorite son of the favorite wife, shh, it's tough. That was Joseph's life. And, and I'm kind of talking about it and almost making light of it, but in reality, it had created such dysfunction, such absolute hatred, that as we saw, his 10 older brothers eventually wanted to kill him, but instead sold him off as a common slave. And Joseph endured 13 hard years until one day God providentially promoted him to being the prime minister of Egypt. I mean, can you imagine that? One day he woke up in prison, and by afternoon he was prime minister of Egypt. That was Joseph's story. And then, providentially, God has his brothers come. And th by this time, it's been 22 years since they sold him as a slave. And here is Joseph, the prime minister of Egypt, and his brothers come to try to buy some food, come to buy some groceries. And Joseph, through God's inspiration, led them through a series of tests just to see where they were. And we got right to the point where there was going to be this big conversation, this crucial conversation, this reconciliation, this, this forgiveness. And then what happened? The country got shut down, church got stopped, and we've been in suspension ever since. That's where we were in the Joseph story. And, and I bring all that up because it's so much like what often happens, there's an offense in a relationship and maybe you say, you know, I've got to talk to him about that. I've got to talk to her about that. I need to confess that. I need to, we need to iron this out because I don't want this thing to become a big deal. And then what happens? We all get distracted. We move on and it never gets taken care of. That's not good. Well, today we're going back and we're going to look at the Joseph story, but Mostly what we're going to do is look at what it reveals to us about this whole thing of forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, in chapter 41 of, or 44 of Genesis, we, we, we get to the part of the story where it's really starting to come to the climax. Benjamin, the youngest brother, has gone with them. They're in Egypt, and, and again, Joseph leads them through this, this, these tests, and Benjamin looks like a common thief. And now there's this big meeting with Joseph and his brothers, and that's where we are. So here's what I want to ask you to do. I'll, in just a minute, I want you to press pause, and I want you to go find a Bible, and if you're watching it with somebody, I want one person to read it and read it out loud. And I want you to read chapter 44, Genesis 44, start at verse 18 and read all the way through chapter 45, verse 14. So one person, read it out loud, read it so everyone can understand it. And I want you to read what Judah had to say to Joseph. And I want you to read what jo how Joseph responded. 
Okay, press pause and then we'll start again here in just a moment. Okay, did you read it? You know, if w this story is so unique, if we were to sit and say, okay, this is, this provides us with a pattern of how this whole thing of forgiveness should take place, that'd probably be inaccurate. Uh, this, this thing is so unique and it's so uh, different than, than most circumstances. I'm not sure that there's a step-by-step -step thing that is here. Probably the very best way to tackle this passage, best way to, to be true to this passage, would be to look at it through the lens of the three major players. There's Joseph, there's God, and there's the brothers. So what I want to do with the time I've got left is I want to talk about Joseph, and I want to talk about God, and then I want to talk about the brothers. And then I want to wrap the time up with just giving you a couple suggestions of takeaways we can get out of it. Now, who was Joseph in this situation? You know who Joseph was? Joseph was the forgiver. Now, did you notice this? I mean, Judah makes this impassioned speech. Joseph is so moved, he stops everything and he says, stop, stop, stop. And then he says, all the Egyptians leave the room. Well, that's, that's kind of a good thing to see right there. I mean, this is family business. And so when Joseph was about to reveal his identity to his brothers, he, he cleared the room. It was probably just Joseph and his 11 brothers. There's Benjamin, who's kind of this outsider, bystander watching it. And it's Joseph, the victim, and the 10 culprits. And he's about to reveal his identity to them. And what does Joseph do? He clears the room and he says, I am Joseph. And then he just keeps talking and talking and talking. You sold me into slavery, but here's what's going to happen. And I want you to move here and I want you to move there. He just keeps going and going and going. And it's like Joseph just totally gives to them. It's like he reveals himself and he starts talking and giving and reaching out. Hey, come closer. Let me hug you. And his brothers are just totally flat-footed. They're not catching. I mean, they're just totally stunned. I mean, literally, they are speechless. But Joseph is giving and giving and giving and giving. Now, all of this leads me to an observation that I think is totally accurate. Joseph was doing that because in reality, he had already forgiven them. He didn't forgive them at that moment. He had already forgiven them. When did Joseph forgive them? Was it the day he saw them at the market the first time? No, I, I think it was long before that. Was it the day when he finally got the call from prison that, hey, Come and interpret Pharaoh's dream. You're going to become the prime minister. I think it was long before that. Was it the day that Mrs. Potiphar tried to seduce him? I think it was before that. Somewhere early on, Joseph had already forgiven them. You know, and, and we ask ourselves, how in the world could that have been? I think when we understand what forgiveness really is, we can see that forgiveness isn't dependent upon that person coming and for confessing. It isn't dependent upon circumstances in my life lining up so that I finally can find it inside myself to forgive this person who so offended me. When we really understand what forgiveness is, we can forgive. You know what forgiveness is? In its simplest form, forgiveness is canceling a debt. In almost every offense, there has been a robbery. Someone has stolen something from you. In Joseph's case, those brothers stole 22 years of his life so that he couldn't have a relationship with his father, so that he couldn't have a relationship with his little brother. Remember we said Benjamin was probably one year old when Joseph was sold as a slave. He didn't know him. He lost all of that relationship with Benjamin. All, he, he lost 
the, any kind of relationship he might have been able to have with his older brothers because of this offense, because of this hurt that they had inflicted upon him. They had stolen things from him. And you know what he did? He canceled that debt. He, it's like they owed him and he had to say, you know what? You don't have to repay me. I mean, many times those offenses that, that we're talking about, they're just like these offenses. They couldn't have given him back that 22 years. They couldn't have given him those conversations he might have had with his dad or those times he might have had with his baby brother. I mean, they owed him something they could never give back. I mean, we sometimes, when it comes to forgiveness, we think, oh, man, if that person would just crawl on their knees and come to me and say, oh, please forgive me, then I can forgive them. You know what? For one thing, it's probably never going to happen. But even if it did, that's not what enables you to forgive. Because deep back in your mind, it's like, this sucker robbed me. This person has kept me from this, I could have had, but for this, you got to cancel that debt. That's what God did with us. We had a debt we could not pay, and Jesus Christ paid it, and God canceled that debt. See, Joseph was able to forgive them long before he ever laid eyes on them because he canceled the debt. He recognized the robbery and he canceled that debt. That's what forgiveness is. And so Joseph is the forgiver. He's giving and giving and giving in a, in a way that, that quite frankly is, is supernatural. But see, this, this is an element of life that is supernatural. We don't do this because we are so gracious. We don't do this because we can reach deep down in our guts and finally pull out that grace. No, this is something God enables us to do. It is to cancel a debt that someone has inflicted upon us and we do it by God's graciousness. Joseph was the giver. You know, one of the things that I think really, really helped Joseph in this is that he also recognized God's role. Joseph was the forgiver, but God was the sovereign. I mean, did you see that? Look at verse 5. God did this. Look at verse 7. God did this. All throughout this passage, God is the one that brought us here. God is the one that set me up for here. I mean, somehow... Joseph had reconciled himself to the fact that he was living in God's providence. You know that word providence, it's a word we don't use very often anymore. And you know, the Puritans used it a bunch. People that lived 200 years ago used it a bunch. I mean, this is an, a classic illustration of God's providence. God's, God's superintending the events. How does he do it? Quite frankly, we don't know. But here's one thing that is true. Whatever your explanation of it is, it better be able to be summarized with these words. God did it. And that's God's providence. Uh, you know, here's how some people like to define God's providence. Uh, it's the guardianship and control exercised by a deity. It's a manifestation of God's foresightful care of his creatures. That's what God was doing. God was somehow superintending his control, his provision, his providence over this whole thing. And, and Joseph so bought into that. That was some, a conviction that Joseph had so deep down that years later, when this whole issue came up again, the way he put it in Genesis 50, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring about the salvation of many. Joseph was the giver, but God was the sovereign, and Joseph understood that God in his providence had it all under control. 
Did he understand the details, the nuts and bolts of it? I seriously doubt it. He, he probably was as clueless about it as we are. But he knew that it was there. And he knew that he was in the place that God had put him. And when he saw that that was so true, that enabled him to cancel that debt with his brothers. So there's Joseph, he's the forgiver. There's God, he's the sovereign. But remember I said there's another party, another player that is important to look at, and that's the brothers. The brothers, you know what they were? They were the takers. Joseph was the giver, they were the takers. Joseph was the giver, they were the receiver. And as you read through that passage, did you notice how flat-footed they were? They literally were speechless. I mean, Joseph just talked, and it's like, you know, a volcano just spewing out all of these things. You brought me here. God's done this. God's done that. I've got it all figured out. We're going to move you guys to Goshen. You're going to become shepherds. Is my dad still alive? This is awesome. We're going to be one big happy family. And the brothers, they were speechless. And then can you imagine Joseph said, come on, come on, let's hug. Come close. I want to see you. They'd probably been social distancing because they thought he was an Egyptian and Egyptians and Jews didn't hang out together, didn't get close to each other. Come close. All of that time, they were just stunned silent. They didn't say a word. Judah had made this big, long speech, the longest speech in the whole book of Genesis. And Joseph says all this stuff, and they are stunned silent, speechless. Why was that? Because they were getting a gift they did not deserve. Did they deserve the forgiveness that Joseph was giving them? Not at all. But you know what is so cool? They accepted it. They accepted that forgiveness. And you know, it was so appropriate that they then followed through with the plan that Joseph had laid out for them. That the forgiver had laid out for them. Did they have to do it? No, they could have said, no, hey, we're, we're going to hang out in, in Canaan. We're, we're not moving to Egypt. But it was so totally appropriate that they followed the instructions of the forgiver. And just before we wrap it up, let me share with you just two takeaways. I think one we get from the brothers, one we get from Joseph. You know what the takeaway is from the brothers? It's be like the brothers. You know what? You got to accept that forgiveness. And I'm not just talking about accepting God's forgiveness for salvation. Even after you've trusted Jesus Christ, you've got to regularly and continually accept his forgiveness. You know what I find? I think one of the things we all struggle with, and, and, and some of us far more than others, and that is that guilt, that burden. Did God really forgive me? Oh, man, I've blown it so horribly. How could I ever get back on track? And you know what? God's forgiveness, Joseph's illustrating it for us. It is complete and total. Sure, okay, there's consequences. Sometimes life has to change. So many relationships might have to be at a little arm's length. But... There's still forgiveness, and we need to accept it. That guilt, uh-uh. And you know what else? We need to follow the plan. The brothers, they needed to move to Goshen. They needed to become shepherds. They needed to do all the things that the forgiver was calling them to do. You know one of the things the forgiver is calling us to do? If we're really going to be like the brothers... We're not just going to accept that forgiveness. We're then going to become like Joseph. And that's the second takeaway. And we're going to give it. I, I think one of my most favorite Bible verses about relationships is Ephesians 4.32. Be kind one to another, 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Did you catch those last couple words? Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Joseph forgave his brothers. And he didn't just do it right there on the spot. He had done it long before. Let me ask you, is there someone you need to forgive? Is there some, is there something you're carrying? Is there a root of bitterness inside of you? The writer of Hebrews told us we need to extract those root of bitternesses. How do you know? I'll tell you how I know. It's that person that I have conversations with in my head. You know, I have arguments with people and I always win them. But you know what? Those are red flags to me that, Richard, you know what? You're still, that's still an issue. You've not forgiven that person. You haven't canceled that debt. You haven't set aside that offense. Is there someone like that in your life? Let me tell you. God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ. And he invites us to lay that debt aside and to forgive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the, the picture of forgiveness that we see in Joseph. Uh, Father, we just have scratched the surface this morning trying to understand it. But I pray, Father, that today we would be people who are forgivers. Uh, Father, we don't fully understand your providence, but we know you were involved in it, and this is something that brings honor and glory to you. We know that Jesus Christ died on the cross to take care of those offenses. And I pray, Father, that today we would be people who would forgive as we've been forgiven by you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God, I need 
need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy your forgiveness is like sweet sweet honey on my lips it's like the sound of a symphony to my ears it's like holy water on my skin oh it's like holy water on my skin yeah it's like holy water your forgiveness Hey, thanks so much for being with us this morning. I trust that God has used it to encourage you, to, to motivate you in your relationship with Him. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Just want to say thank you to Don and Lisa and Caroline and all the other people that, that participated this morning. Uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and we appreciate it so much. I hope you'll plan on joining us Wednesday night. We've got a gathering uh, together. It's fun, it's enjoyable, and it's very, very sweet. So uh, go to the website for the, for the link. We'd love to have you. We love you. We miss you. We can't wait to come back together and worship corporately together. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.